We have a special treat. We have a physician, Dr. Venkat Raman, who's an electrophysiologist, and he visits with, uh, to us today from our Woodlands Methodist and Willowbrook Methodist program. I'd like Dr. Venkat Raman to speak about preventing sudden cardiac death. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me over here. And um, uh, I have a very difficult topic, which is preventing sudden cardiac death. And um, uh, let, me, let me describe a little bit why I describe this as a very difficult topic. Um, I really don't have any relevant disclosures for this talk. The definition of sudden cardiac death uh, is death due to cardiac causes occurring within one hour of the onset of symptoms, all right? So uh, sudden death is not really what you would describe about somebody who died inside a hospital, right? So you're talking about somebody who is presumably okay and had some symptoms, whether it is shortness of breath, dizziness, chest pain, name what, and dies within an hour of the onset, all right? So the key here is sudden, all right? Keep that in mind. Uh, a little bit about the epidemiology of sudden death. Uh, in the US, about 365,000 people die in out of hospital arrests every year. Uh, let me ask, uh, I guess I can't ask you this question, but the rough number of traffic related deaths in the US every year is only 40,000. That gives you a perspective of how many people are dropping dead, all right? So out of these arrests, only about you know 20,000 are witnessed arrest with bystander CPR, and only about 31% survive. Just run the numbers in your head. I mean, you're talking 10 times the number of people who drive, who die in a, on the road are dropping dead with sudden death, and a minuscule percentage is witnessed, and among those who are witnessed, I mean, hardly anybody makes it to the hospital, and the people who make it into the hospital, uh, we can count in our hand among the percentage of patients who walk out uh, without any neurological defect or name what, okay? So essentially, this is a huge burden, okay? And remember, 50% of all cardiac-related deaths itself is sudden, and the last line is the most important thing. This proportion is essentially unchanged, all right? Remember, you've had all, you've been sitting here all through the day listening to all the wonderful advances in coronary disease, heart failure, valve-related problems, but remember, we're not doing anything about sudden death. Sudden death is sudden, okay? It happens. It's gonna happen at some point to that patient that you're seeing in your office, the 50-year-old, could drop dead. So the trick here is to figure out who could be that 50-year-old, okay? So it's not an easy topic. If you look at the overall sudden cardiac deaths, okay, um, most of them are happening. You see the, the, the pie chart on the right is no heart disease, or rather, I should say, no known heart disease, right? These patients are patients that anti-mortem, we have no diagnosis of anything, and they have dropped dead. The red chart is those with heart disease, but LV function more than 40%. Now, why do I say that? Because when your LV function becomes weak, those are the patients who benefit from defibrillators, and I'm sure you know that patients with EF, which is low, they always get a defibrillator. But remember, that only accounts for the green portion of the pie chart, okay? And then the smallest portion is channelopathies or genetic-related diseases, which we will talk about. But if you look at it, this whole section that uh, complete uh, this guy and these people, we do not have that many good markers for how to predict that they're gonna drop dead. Now, my pet peeve whenever somebody tells me that somebody arrested is, uh, I typically love to say this, I hope there are no residents or fellows in this room, they love to use this term saying, Dr. V, this patient coded. Coded means nothing to me or to any cardiologist. My only question is, I don't know what you mean by coded. Is it VF or is it PEA? Why does that matter? It matters a lot because if you look at it, the worst prognosis is PEA and asystole, all right? Because there's a lot of things 
that could be wrong in your differential. Uh, VF, we know for about 200 years now, you shock the heart and you get it back, right? So VF is good, you, can, you know how to fix it. But PEA and asystole obviously has a very poor prognosis, all right? So when I uh, had this topic, I was thinking, should I, since I was lumped up with the heart failure section, I thought, should I talk more about ICDs? But then uh, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't talk about the global problem of sudden death. So the way I look at sudden death is I split it into three people. One is young patients that you all see in your clinic as primary doctor, primary practice providers and family practice athletes, young people. The second group is the guys, those with structural heart disease, right, who probably are already seeing a cardiologist. And then all patients about 35 who may, may not have structural heart disease, all right? Now, those with structural heart disease, uh, I'm going to talk very importantly about coronary artery status on these patients. Right? Remember, autopsy evidence of acute coronary syndrome is found in almost 50% of patients with sudden death with a history of CAD. So these are patients who are walking around who all of a sudden drop dead. You do an autopsy, they have an acute MI. So essentially, this argues that in every patient with coronary disease, you have to work very hard on intensive risk factor modification. I'm not going to dwell more on that, but the point is that Almost 5% of all sudden deaths also have ACS on autopsy. And some patients do not even have a diagnosis of CAD before uh, they drop dead. So intensive risk factor modification of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, I think, and hyperlipidemia goes hand in hand in preventing uh, a massive MI, which, is, which presents a sudden death. Now, when it comes to left ventricular function in patients uh, with structural heart disease, the 35% is kind of a well-ingrained risk factor. And I want to state this, that less than 35%, less than equal to 35% is a proven risk factor for sudden death. Those are the patients that you see who see a cardiologist and then see an electrophysiologist. They come back to your clinic with a big hulk of a defibrillator in their chest, right? But what do we do about the patients whose EF happens to be more than 35%? Remember, when your EF is 35 to 50%, like um, the heart failure uh, talk that you heard, but the EF is more than 40%, they're not completely normal, but we don't know what predicts sudden death in these pa patients, and so it's neither specific nor very sensitive. If you look at the old trials, you know, this came out way back in 2002. This was patients with LV ejection fraction less than 30%. As you can see, those who got a defibrillator clearly lived longer uh, than conventional therapy. This is uh, so well ingrained right now. And then we had another trial in 2005 where they tested patients with congestive heart failure and they tested them by giving them either amiodarone or just placebo or put in a defibrillator. Those with defibrillator lived longer. Uh, so defibrillator beat amiodarone. So, uh, again, all these trials have essentially established some very clear rules, which is that when your LV ejection fraction is less than 35%, and you've been on optimal goal-directed medical therapy for more than 90 days, which includes ischemics and non-ischemics, and you're 90 days post-revascularization. Now, why do we say that? Is because sometimes once you fix coronary disease, the heart function can improve. So you don't want to implant a defibrillator in somebody whose heart failure could improve. Or 40 days post-acute MI, uh, these patients will uh, benefit from a defibrillator. Now, let me talk to you why this 40-day MI rule showed up. This was a trial which was done called Dynamite, where they did, where they took patients with, who had a massive MI, and their EF was low. So immediately they said, we're gonna put one group in which we're gonna put in a defibrillator, and the other group, we're not gonna do anything. So the all-cost mortality was unchanged in patients when you implanted a defibrillator immediately after an MI. Why? Because many of these patients are eventually going to die of pump failure, all right? Meaning the heart function is so weak, just because you prevent arrhythmia death does not mean that the heart is gonna survive, all right? 
To quote one of my old mentors, he would always say this, dead meat, don't beat. You can keep, you can keep uh, sending electricity as much as you want, it's dead, it's not gonna move, all right? So again, that's, I mean, all these studies which these criteria come out very commonly, I'm sure every cardiology office has got this cheat sheet where you know, you talk about 90 days revascularization, 40 days post MI. I mean, these are all based on the trials, all right? So these are well-known factors, okay? Now, as non-cardiologists, I would argue that this is a group that you are probably not that worried about because these patients probably almost always have a cardiologist taking care of them, all right? What you would be more worried about is the patients who don't really fall into this bin, who don't fall into the bin of low heart failure, all right? Now, a lot of novel markers have been attempted over the years. Um, T wave alternance, I know Paul is gonna talk about EKG, so I'm gonna not get into details here, but T wave alternance, J point elevation, fractionation, you know how the EKG looks very squiggly, like fractionated QRS complex, LVH. However, none of these have ever proven to be predictive, either sensitive or specific for sudden death, all right? They exist if you look at small studies, but they have not panned out. Very interestingly, if you look at um, a lot of these studies have actually shown that patients who are at sudden death actually have poor auto autonomic nervous system control. Like, again, that goes hand in hand. Who drops dead? Your diabetic who probably never had coronary disease diagnosed with it. So the question is, how do you pick the diabetic, right? Something as simple as the resting heart rate, okay? Now, uh, I would always argue with my staff saying that, you know, when you give me a stress test report, always everybody scrolls down to the bottom line of the stress test and says, no ischemia, normal perfusion. But nobody looks at the fact that the stress test shows you something extraordinary, which is what is the resting heart rate, okay? If you have resting bradycardia, the risk of sudden death is much lower. In patients with resting tachycardia, meaning your heart rate at rest, is 90 or 100, uh, these patients are at higher risk for sudden death, okay? This has been proven uh, on multiple treadmill studies. Uh, again, this argues that some of these patients have some autonomic dysfunction, which we're not able to quantify, but we know that this is sort of a marker, all right? So moving on to younger folks, all right? When, and uh, how many of you see predominantly younger patients with a show of hands like nurse practitioner, like 20 year olds, 25 year olds, 30 year olds, not many? Not many at all, all right. Okay, so completely irrelevant, but still, I think it's important. The thing is, um, the EKG screening is not mandated currently by the AHA for athletes, all right? But European guidelines uh, are very strict and they recommend standard EKG screens. I'm sure you've all watched on CNN or some other news channel, this basketball player in high school playing and all of a sudden drops dead on the court. Now remember, uh, channelopathies, meaning hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or Brugada or LQT, they account for majority of sudden cardiac deaths in patients less than 40 years old, okay? so. Whenever somebody wants to start a new exercise program or is young with some dizziness, I think a complete and thorough HNP and an EKG screen, I would argue, is probably mandatory. Uh, let me pass over this. Let me give you this example of this very benign looking case that I just saw last week. There's a young woman, 46 year old from Spain, passing out cold for the last four years, multiple episodes of syncope, all right? No prodromal symptoms. She was driving, dropped dead, dropped flat. Has actually seen, believe it or not, three cardiologists. Normal echoes, normal coronaries. Let me show you her EKG here. So you look at V1, you can see that it has an incomplete right bundle, and that is an ST elevation. This was an EKG in 2015. Brugada syndrome was first described by Peter Brugada, who's from Spain. Remember where my patient is from? She's from Spain. And I, I listened to her story and I'm, I'm completely getting shocked. And I looked at her EKG from three years ago, Brugada syndrome, and this is EKG from 2018. It's 
you can clearly see the ST elevation and uh, the incomplete right ball. This is diagnostic. So she was somebody who obviously benefited with a defibrillator. So to quickly go over channelopathies, these diagnoses are all established based on a 12-lead EKG. We get it all the time, take some time to look at it. Uh, unfortunately, artificial intelligence is not yet here to make a complete diagnosis on an EKG, but you can at least take a look at it and say, hey, this looks funky. Yes, long QT, short QT, Brugada syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in all these things, the EKG is diagnostic, and a good history is probably the most important thing, including family history. Family history of sudden cardiac death is probably the worst uh, 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 symptom or I'm, I'm not a, a prognostic marker. If you have family history of sudden cardiac death, that's probably the worst. Uh, genetic testing nowadays accounts for pretty much most of the genes, and we highly recommend gene testing, even in patients who've had, like let's somebody, someone comes and tells you, my brother dropped dead at the age of 45, uh, we would tell them to make sure that his brother gets gene tested, you know, as part of the autopsy. So to summarize, I would say that current models and markers for risk of sudden death are neither sensitive nor specific. What we would argue is, again, optimal goal-directed treatment of CAD, CHF, and patients with structural heart disease will benefit with, uh, an, uh, with a defibrillator when your EF is less than 35. And whenever you have a young patient who has funky symptoms of dizziness or syncope, get a good history, and please remember to screen them uh, with an EKG. Um, now, the last two slides, I want to go this very quickly. Since we cannot predict sudden death, can we do anything else, right? Um, this is a map of Seattle, and you can see that this is uh, King County in Washington. Now, why do I say, King, why do I put this up? Because King County in Washington encouraged CPR training for everybody. They have the most number of lay citizens who are, uh, who are trained in CPR, and they have AEDs pretty much in most places. Look at their uh, current cardiac arrest survival. Every year, it goes up dramatically. And that's not going up because they're treating coronary diseases, because more people are trained in CPR and use of AED. That's something to be kept in mind. I will leave you with my thoughts that death is always sudden, however long one waits. All right, any questions? <laughs>